Before I had a YouTube channel, I did have enough of a web presence that you could figure out a fair bit about me, uh, what kind of person I am, by, by poking around. I've, I've always had a name that's easy to Google, easy to put into Google and find uh, accurate results, unlike someone named John Smith. Actually, you know, before I met my first wife, she Googled me, and I remember she told some of her relatives about me, and they Googled me, and they found articles I'd written, and they even found some, uh, some receipts from the political work I did at City Hall in Toronto. There were traces of that floating around the internet. Uh, so essays I'd written, articles I'd written, and, and, and you could figure out what kind of person I was. I remember I met face-to-face -face a young woman in Taiwan who had done some Google searching about me. And one of the things she said to me, once in a while people ask me questions along these lines, she basically said to me, look, is everything about politics with you? You know, well, <laughs> Melissa's laughing, but I don't care. You said, in a positive way, you said that to me. You haven't said it to me in like a snarky or snide way, but once in a while you kind of do ask a question like that. And the reason why this young woman was, was asking, she was Chinese, but she was really passionate about English, English literature. I think she wanted to do a master's in English literature or something like that. And, and you know, in a, in a real sense, I'm not. I'm interested in literature as a means to an end, that's social or political or some kind of commentary or something. But literature for the sake of literature, I'm not into. Gin for the sake of gin, I'm not into, you know, et cetera. Uh, uh, so, you know, she, <laughs> she, she asked me this question and she was getting at, you know, isn't there something to be said for reading just for the beauty of reading or writing, you know, just for the beauty of writing? But what I find, I mean, especially within the field of, of literature or in academic fields that get, I think, kind of perverted by the attitudes of, of literary studies, what I always find is that these people really fail to appreciate the significance of the works they're reading. Uh, and they, they utterly fail to grasp the intentions of the author, even when they're explicitly stated, because they're not studying the social and political context they're writing in. Now, one of the most extreme examples is the politics of Aristotle. And, and people read Aristotle like literature, even though the word politics is written on the cover. Um, I, I have, I'm haunted by a very precise memory. I mean, my life might be easier if I, I, I shuffled along without remembering these things. I'm reading this book now at age 39. I think the last time I read this book, or tried to read it, I think I was younger than 19. Um, and I, I'm reading it, I can remember what my impressions were of it then, what I got and didn't got, to some extent, obviously. I don't have a perfect photograph memory. And I can see how, how differently I, I apprehend the text today. But one of the crucial differences is now, uh, partly thanks to secondary sources that I'll, I'll provide links to, uh, below this this video, partly due to primary sources, you know, that I've read and where you, you put the pieces together. I really have a sense of the pressure that Aristotle was under to say things in support of monarchy, and not just any monarchy, but the, the Macedonian monarchy, the incredibly brutal and violent empire that had sprung into existence during Aristotle's life an empire he had direct personal contact with and that his father had direct personal contact with, with before him, um, and an empire that he evidently uh, uh, vehemently opposed. But he was in a position to state that, that opposition, sometimes obliquely and sometimes directly, in a really, really fraught you know, political circumstances. Now, I can't say, I can't say nobody uh, examines the text this way, it looks like starting in the 1970s, a small number of authors wanted to look at uh, Aristotle this way. And I've got secondary sources, contemporary scholarship, uh, I'm looking, and they have been received very, very negatively. So those authors were kind of lampooned by other scholars saying, oh, you want to misrepresent uh, um, Aristotle. You want to misrepresent Aristotle as if he's a super spy, as if he's the James Bond working for, for Macedonia and so on. And you know, this showed a real reluctance on the part of scholars to take seriously the extent to which the, the political context shaped explicitly political writing in, in Athens. But in this video, very briefly, I'm going to try to break down for you why it is that the politics of Aristotle is still to this day a very difficult text to interpret, and why you must interpret it in, in light of the stated, uh, the, 
the stated intentions of the author, not some psychological theory I'm making up, uh, not, not something beneath the surface, something that's on the surface, but where you do have to pick up the pieces and, and put it together. Uh, you have to do the legwork yourself. When I read this at age 19, this was my thought process, whereby I dismissed the empirical evidence before me. And I, I frankly, just now, in doing reading of, of contemporary scholars with PhDs, formal academics, I think some of them are making the same mistake as adults with PhDs that I made when I was 19 or younger and struggling with this text. Their first thought is, Aristotle is a famous philosopher. And then with that assumption, they look at the biographical details of his life and dismiss them or sneer at them, thinking that they're largely made up to to glorify or glamorize Aristotle. So they, they see the story that Aristotle was the tutor to Alexander the Great as if it's something made up after the fact because Aristotle was such a famous name and this could be, this could be tacked on uh, after the fact. There's absolutely no evidence to support that attitude. You have to look at the situation the exact opposite way. You have to look at the life of Aristotle and realize he wasn't a famous philosopher. That happened later. In, in the biography of his life, at least the first half of it, most of his life, he's not famous for anything. He's not a famous or important person. He's not from Athens. He's not an Athenian. He's not welcome in Athens. He's a hated outsider in an intensely xenophobic country or xenophobic city-state, however you want to say it. He can in no way participate in Athenian democracy. He's looking at it from afar as a somewhat despised northern barbarian. Now, not only is he a northern barbarian, he's a northern barbarian who is intimately and directly linked to um, the house of Philip II. Now, Philip II, right up to the moment when he was assassinated, was the most important political figure of his era. Um, he was as important to his era as Napoleon Bonaparte was in a different era. He was the single most powerful and unexpectedly powerful political figure who was suddenly changing the political landscape of the world, conquering countries, subduing nations, and negotiating peace treaties, and so on. He, his, he and his army were sweeping aside the, the collected assumptions of, of former centuries, and totally unexpectedly so, because he was, from the perspective of the Athenians, a despised, uncultured northern barbarian. Aristotle's father was the medical doctor to Philip II. And the upward social mobility of Aristotle as a person was entirely linked to the fact that he had these connections to the court of Philip II. Now, it is by no means remarkable, I mean, especially given all the documentary evidence we have, uh, including the last will and testament of Aristotle, there's quite a lot of corroborating elements. There's nothing remarkable uh, about the claim that Aristotle was one of the tutors who worked for Philip II in tutoring Alexander the Great. And again, remember, when he got that job, Alexander the Great wasn't Alexander the Great yet. Um, it was by no means obvious to the people involved that Philip II would go on to become this incredibly important historical figure or that his son would go on to become uh, an even larger uh, historical figure that would cast the whole world in his shadow. On the contrary... If we delete all of this biographical evidence, that it's anyway, sorry, it's it's much, it's as real as any biographical evidence we have for any ancient figure uh, in the ancient world. There's no reason to regard this as mythology whatsoever. Um, if this were not true, in terms of Occam's Razor, it would be incredibly difficult to explain how this bumpkin from the far north managed to come back to Athens at precisely the time when the Macedonians conquered Athens, forced the Athenians into a humiliating submission, set up a garrison basically occupying Athens after the, uh, the destruction of Olynthus. I just know that's, I'm not mispronouncing Olympus. This is a different city-state, city Olynthus. Um, and indeed, there's, there's a later rebellion in which they absolutely, in which Alexander absolutely devastates Thebes. These are not the only times that, that Athens rises up in rebellion against the expanding power of, uh, of Macedonia. So, by the way, one reason why I wanted to record this video today 
right now on the calendar, I'm recording this on the night of June 17th, 2018, the political conflict between Greece and Macedonia ended today in 2018. They just signed the, the peace treaty, the mutual recognition. Oh, you didn't know this? This is one of the big news stories today. Uh, Greece, up until yesterday, would not recognize the existence of, of Macedonia as a separate country. There are particular modern reasons for that. But the, the tensions do indeed go back to the struggle between Greece and Macedonia. Um, in this case, it was partly the suspicion that um, Macedonia would try to conquer some of the provinces of what's now modern Greece that historically in the past were part of ancient Macedonia. They tried to reunify the ancient borders of Macedonia. They wanted reassurances for that. But in any case, this political history, I mean, the influence of Aristotle goes on today in many, many ways. But specifically, the, the, the political conflict between Athens and Macedonia amazingly has continued right down literally to today when a new agreement, a political agreement, was signed between Greece and Macedonia where for the first time Greece would recognize Macedonia and now for the first time Macedonia is going to be allowed to join international organizations where formerly they were vetoed from entering. They'll be allowed to join NATO and the European Union and various United Nations bodies because before every single time Greece would stand up and veto it and say, no, we, we don't, we don't, we can't acknowledge, we can't admit this hostile foreign country. So, <laughs> it, for many different reasons, Aristotle might be uh, might be turning over in his grave. So, if if Aristotle were not um, a, a courtesan, if he weren't a fixture at the court of Philip II and then his son uh, Alexander the Great, how is it that just when Macedon um, humiliates, conquers, occupies Athens? And Athens, they do surrender. I mean, the details of exactly how the war goes are not really worth recounting this video. Um, again, you can you can click through and read, read the primary sources. Why is it that? It, how is it, or why is it that exactly at that time, Aristotle shows up and builds a new school for philosophy? He doesn't take over Plato's school, which is inside the walls of Athens. He sets up a rival school outside the walls, where foreigners are allowed to live because he's a hated foreigner. He's a hated foreigner on the side of the Macedonians, the despised and resented uh, conquering army that's trying to unite the Greeks for their own you know, political purposes. But it's an openly anti-democratic, monarchical, uh, despotic regime that's, that's spread it up. How is it that he sets up uh, his, own, his own small university, whatever you call it, the, the Lyceum, outside of the walls, and why is it that he suddenly has to flee from Athens precisely when Alexander the Great dies, when the news comes back to Athens that Alexander the Great is dead and the Athenians start rising in revolt against Macedonian power? That's when he arrives. That's when he leaves. His patronage is clear. Even in his last will and testament, his connection to the, uh, the Macedonian government um, the Macedonian region appointed to rule Greece while Alexander is away fighting wars is very clear. And we even have the indictments against him from the Athenian perspective, which include indictments against him after his death because he died <laughs> thereafter. But we have the evidence of him being denounced by the Athenians for working for the Macedonian side. All right? So, the, 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 and, I mean, ultimately, it's even the, the ancient sources say this. He fled Athens because he didn't want to share the fate of Socrates. The charge that was laid against him while he was there, while he was in Athens, and while he was alive, was uh, impiety or heresy, was a religious charge, but it was very clear that it was, uh, it was political, politically motivated, as was the case with Socrates. And then, uh, you know, as I said, we actually have further evidence after he'd already died of him further being uh, denounced by the people of Athens, showing the attitude of Athenian Democrats toward him. Okay, So there is absolutely every reason, when you understand this political context, there is every reason why... Oh, I should have fixed my color before filming this. I oh, didn't even think to. That's eh, all right. Politics in pajamas. Hashtag politics in pajamas. <laughs> um, there would be every reason for Aristotle to be writing in a staunchly pro-Macedonian way, in a staunchly pro-monarchy way, in a staunchly anti-democratic way in this book. And he's not. He's being profoundly subversive. He's biting the hand that the, feeds him. He's being a very harsh critic of exactly the regime that he's relied on for his subsistence, for his survival, his whole life, including right there in Athens where he's despised by the Athenians. 
you must read the book in that context to have any clue about what's going on. This is, for the ancient world, this is a remarkably long book. It's a remarkably detailed book. And he pulls in particular examples and he names particular rulers from across the map, including remote and obscure small towns in what's now Turkey. So when he wants to, you know, prove a point, he'll say, oh, well, you know, when you have a democracy and then you, it becomes corrupt because you have demagogues that are taking bribes, this sort of problem can happen. For example, and he'll name these obscure rulers in these obscure cities from 300 years of history before this happened. He did a lot of research in this sense, drawing together these kinds of examples. And we have the names of different rulers and demagogues and democratic leaders preserved in this book. They come up in passing this way as examples to prove his point. How many times does the name of Alexander the Great appear in this book from Aristotle? Zero. Alexander the Great, who when this book was written, was the dominant figure in the politics of the known world. His name is not mentioned even once, despite the fact that Aristotle knew him personally, was one of his teachers, not his only teacher by any means, stretch of the imagination. That Aristotle and his father before him had both been employees of King Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great. He was incredibly close to that regime. And yet what he wrote for hundreds of pages, a remarkably long book, in many ways his life's work, what he devoted his whole life to, building up to, it, it is a very strange indictment of empire, monarchy, war itself, kingship, the inevitable injustice of having one man rule over others. And I say this, I could now follow this up with a long essay or a long series of, of, of videos. He says this straining against what I think is not just censorship, but a very real fear for his life. When Aristotle left the employ of Philip II, when he ceased to be the tutor for uh, Alexander the Great, he nominated his replacement. And his replacement was an historically real person. I did check in. It's the, the legend about this, or the story about this, is not the only proof we have that this was a real person. This was a real historical incident. Uh, if you read the account as stated by uh, Diogenes Laertius, who's as reliable as any historical source we're ever going to get for this period of history, um, Diogenes Laertius simply says that Aristotle nominated this other somewhat famous philosopher, known, known to history, historically noted philosopher, to replace him as a tutor and as the advisor at the court of King Philip II. But he spoke too freely. He was put in a cage, he was tortured, and then he was fed to lions after a long, slow, painful death. That was an event that had a lot of witnesses, that was an event that was recorded for history by many sources. So if you said one word that crossed King Philip or his son Alexander the Great, if you weren't sufficiently flattering, if you weren't careful about what you said, you could end up dead. This is the political context in which Aristotle wrote a deeply conflicted, strangely self-censored, in some ways strangely self-contradictory work. And it's a work that today remains difficult for people to interpret. But you can interpret it. You can get the point. You just have to overcome this strange culture of reading these things as literature. You have to look at the work and the intention of the author in its historical and political context.